Hello everyone. Today we are pleased and honored to have Professor Tiago, who will give us a lecture on uh, applications of NMR, especially applications and uh, measurements and principles related to time domain uh, relaxometry, which is based upon the relaxation time, the longitudinal rela relaxation time, and the transverse relaxation time. He's going to explain and also to give some applications and also some hands-on or some um, explanations how to measure and how these parameters can be useful for us to understand um, properties of food stuff. So Professor Tiago studied at uh, Federal University of São Carlos, your, your doctor, your fellow uh, uh, It's not Federal, it's the study, it's okay. It will speak. Sorry, Mark, I, I, I thought oh, you were yeah. asking me. Okay, it's fine, yeah. but um, and also Tiago, so Tiago can can explain uh, better. But yeah. Tiago, Tiago worked with Colnago. Yeah. We call it professor. Indeed, he's a researcher, but he has um, he has formed already or has uh, instructed many doctors which work with uh, NMR. In, in spread all over Brazil. So, yeah. So, thank you, Thiago. And, uh, yeah. Okay. You can I'll share. I'll share my screen. screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Just, okay. Okay, so uh, thank you, Marcos. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me for this talk. Uh, uh, this talk, I will talk about nuclear magnetic resonance some techniques, applications, and measurements, right? This is, uh, my name is Thiago Bueno de Moraes. You have my contact here. And I am a professor from Federal University of Minas Gerais. As, as Marco said, I have a degree in physics in 2008 from Sao Paulo University, University of Sao Paulo. Then uh, I did my master and uh, um, a doctorate in applied physics in 2011, 2016. During my doctorate, I spent a year at uh, Aachen University with Professor Ben de Bluch, uh, which maybe some of you, some of you know. Uh, he has a lot of works in. Uh, low field NMR and also in high field NMR. Um, then I came back to Brazil and started a postdoctorate project in, again at the University of Sao Paulo uh, and together with uh, Petrobras, that is the, the biggest oil company, petroleum company in Brazil. And we developed some methods for time domain NMR but uh, the focus was like uh, polymers, oil, and materials of their interest. Then, since uh, last year, uh, I started at the uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais as a professor here in the chemistry department. This is the logo here. Just to, to show you a little bit about South America, we, the yellow parts here are Brazil, and the, these are the, the names of the main states. I am here in Minas Gerais. So, uh, maybe some of you 
know the Rio de Janeiro, this picture of Rio de Janeiro is just this point. This is Sao Paulo, and well, we are here, and the city is at the city of Belo Horizonte in Minas Gerais. Belo Horizonte is a very big city, the third most populous metropolitan area in Brazil. Almost six million people live here. Um, it's a very nice city. Okay, so just some more pictures. Uh, this is the campus of Federal University. And this is a picture of the chemistry department. Um, here, a picture of our lab, NMR, uh, high resolution uh, lab. Okay, so uh, in this talk, uh, Marcus already said to me that you saw the basics of NMR. And I will talk just a little bit about the basis. Then I will discuss about the instruments for high-resolution high spectroscopy NMR and also for low-resolution or low-field NMR uh, with electrometry. Then I will talk a little bit about the, the main techniques that we use, electrometry, pulse sequences, a little bit of that analysis. And uh, after that, uh, show some applications in a little bit about general materials and food analysis, right? So, uh, let's remember that uh, NMR is a type of spectroscopy, and the spectroscopy is the study of the interaction of light and matter. Uh, in chemistry, we have several types of uh, spectroscopies, such as ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy, and here we are talking about uh, the nuclear spins of the atom. So, it's uh, an spectroscopy to see the energy levels of the nuclear spin. And there are uh, some nuclei that are active in, for NMR, like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and uh, for this, the NMR technique is uh, very powerful for organic components, as you can see. Okay, then uh, let's see that the nuclear spin uh, is just like a small magnet, as you can see here in this picture. And what you, we want is to detect the, the signal from these uh, atoms. So, in, in, we have different equipments to do it. And when we have a very intense magnetic field and a very homogeneous magnetic field, we can uh, determine information from the, the tiny structures of the molecules, like for example, here you can determine the, the distances, the angles, the, the bond atoms, the connectivity between them. So high resolutions provides information from the molecular level. Then um, we also have equipments that are uh, made for imaging NMR. They are based on the same physical principles but uh, they are different equipments that you can have an imaging, right? That is very important for meds and hospitals. And also, we have a third kind uh, type of equipments that we call time domain NMR or low resolution NMR, low field NMR. And they do not have enough resolution to see the chemical structures, the chemical information, but we can have a more macroscopic um, view of our sample, like viscosity, hardness, moisture, porosity, and so on, as you talk. Right. So, uh, we had a sample here, and we have a nuclear, active nucleus, nuclear, that act like tiny magnets. 
outside a magnetic field, um, we, uh, the nuclei are in random directions, the spin nuclei are in random directions, so we do not have uh, uh, a magnetization here. The magnetization, uh, the total magnetization of the sample is null. When we insert our sample in a magnetic field, in an external magnetic field, the, like for example, 9.4 Tesla, the nuclear spin will process, will do this movement, as you can see here, and will be separated in for uh, one and a half spin in two energy levels, as you can see. And in this spectroscopy, we want to see these energy levels. So uh, the nuclear spin, for example, of hydrogen will process with a processing frequency that depends on the nuclei because of the constant here. And uh, for hydrogen, is four times the, the precession frequency of the carbon in the same magnetic field, as you can see. All right. So the next step you see here is to insert uh, a probe that is um, essentially a coil uh, around the sample that uh, with this probe, we can apply um, pulses of radio frequencies to observe the, the transitions of the, the nuclear spin in the spectroscopy level. And uh, also we can detect the signal uh, of this sample, right? So here, um, it's easier to, to understand uh, how we detect the signal when we think about the total magnetization in the sample. So in blue here, I represent uh, the, the total magnetization in the sample. When we apply the radio frequency pulse of 90 degrees, for example, the magnetization goes from here to here. And uh, this position uh, is not stable. So the, the nuclear spin will process and return to the equilibrium position. And these returns occurs with the, the precession of the nuclei. So this total magnetization will process like in this way here. And with our probe, that is our sensor, uh, the, the sensor will detect a signal, as you can see here that decays until zero, um, that we call the free induction decay, right? And uh, as you can see, the, the amplitude of the signal depends on the amount of nuclei that I have, and also this frequency is the, the frequencies of the nuclear spin, the precession of this nuclear spin, and also we have a relaxometry time here that we will discuss uh, later. And uh, well, we digitalize the signal and uh, we do data analysis, for example, with Fourier transform, it's a mathematical procedure, to obtain the spectra, the spectrum of this uh, sample. Okay, so from the spectra, we know how to determine chemical information, right? Just show you here uh, an animation of this process of the, the total magnetization returns to the equilibrium position, right? Okay, so uh, in high resolution in MR, uh, what we have, it, for example, for ethanol here, is that uh, um, the hydrogens here in this molecule are not feeling the, the same effective magnetic field, but they are feeling different uh, effective magnetic field. So when we detect the signal of this sample and do the Fourier transform, we obtain a spectrum like this, where we can identify which peak represents uh, each um, 
chemical environment of the, the sample. And from the time structures of these spectra, also uh, um, discover more about uh, the chemical structure, right? So here uh, I show some, some equipments of NMR. Of course, we have the, the high field with high homogeneity, high resolution NMR with the large scale labs. Um, for chemical structure, for determination of chemical structure, of course. And we also have the, the low field that uh, is more uh, cheap equipment, it's not so expensive. And we prefer to use this kind of equipment in quality control, in industries, um, for imaging, NMR, um, in petroleum science, also petrophysics. Of course, here uh, we have also the intermediate field that are some benchtop equipment that have intermediate um, resolution. But we will talk more about this and this one here. Okay. So uh, all these instruments, these equipments, they are based three components. They are like three parts. The computer, where you do uh, control the experiment, do the data analysis, and so on. The spectrometer, where uh, you have all the necessary electronics to apply the radio frequency pulses, to amplify the signals, to digitalize the signals, and so on. We also need the, the magnet, where we apply our external magnetic field, uh, and also the probe, that is our sensor and the, the system that apply the, the pulse, the pulse. All right. So here I just show some equipment of imaging and MR. Uh, here you are the sample, right? You go here inside and you can have images, but we are not focused here on imaging and MR, just to show you. And this is, for example, a high resolution MR. So computer, the, the console, the spectrometer, and here a superconductor magnet. Of course, to produce the magnetic field, we can use permanent magnets or superconductor, superconductor magnets. Uh, and the sample goes just inside, as you can see. Just to take a look uh, inside of the, the superconductor magnet, we, we have something like this. Here you see that there are a solenoid, uh, that's a superconductor solenoid, that will produce the, the magnetic field in, for your sample. Uh, but these need to be working in uh, very low temperature. So we have a chamber of uh, liquid helium here, another chamber of liquid nitrogen, and a vacuum chamber here, and all this to keep the solenoid in the superconductor um, conditions with very low temperature. And uh, just to remember, when we have an electric current in a wire, uh, you have a magnetic field around it. For a solenoid, uh, when you have an uh, electric current here, uh, you have a magnetic field just like, uh, similar to a permanent magnet. So, for example, here inside, and with this solenoid and other uh, solenoids, uh, complex system, you can produce a very intense magnetic with a very homogeneity field. So, just showing more pictures about the, the equipment. Uh, this is a NMR tube, a 5 millimeters NMR tube. This is the spinner where you place the, your sample. Um, this is the radio frequency coil of the probe that uh, uh, will apply the radio frequency pulses 
uh, and detect the signal when it matched inside the magnet. There's a region of detection in the mirror tube, right? And okay, that's it. Just some more details when you go um, do some NMR acquisition, you need to tune the, the frequency that you want to detect because you need to choose uh, what nuclei you want to observe, like the hydrogen or the carbon and so on. So we have some capacitors that we need to, to map the, the frequency, just like the old radios that you just need to, to map the, what the channel you want to, to hear. So um, the tuning, then we need to, to shimmy the, the magnetic field to apply um, the same um, at the same intensity of the magnetic field in all your sample. Uh, this is important to, to you have this resolution in your spectra that you can use to, to determine the, 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 small, the tiny differences in the model, right? And also, in just in, in, in high resolution NMR, we use deuteric solvents to to keep the, the frequency correctly, the, to maintain the the the, the uh, to have a, a good spectra in the high field high resolution NMR. But in low field NMR, we do not use this deuteric solvents, right? So this is uh, better for low field, right? It's there is no need for it. Um, okay, then um, Marcus had talked to you about pulse sequences, but just to, to continue the, the history here, uh, we have different pulse sequences that we can apply in our sample. Like the, the, the most simple one is just a single pulse of some degrees. And where you have a relaxation time, time you need to wait for the spins to relax, relaxation. Then we apply the pulse and acquire a signal. Of course, you choose the, the channel, for example, for hydrogen. And then you obtain a free induction decay, as you can see here, and processing the, the spectra. This uh, spectra, uh, spectrum will have some noise, experimental noise, of course, and to reduce the noise, we do uh, we acquire several signals, right? In, in other words, we repeat this uh, this pulse sequences several times to accumulate the signals and uh, uh, to improve the signal to noise her A2 of our spectra. There are other parameters that we need to um, optimize in our spectrometer, like the receiver gain. Uh, as you can see here, if our sensor uh, is not well with the, the um, optimal conditions, you can have some distortions in your signal. For example, if you your sensor are in this condition, the gain is too high, so we will have some distortions. Also, if the gain is too low, it's not good, you need to optimize this parameter. For, for different pulse sequences, you need to optimize different parameters of the, the pulse sequences. Just uh, to, to make clear, um, the different pulse sequences we have some utility, like for example, this is the, the simplest one to understand, is when you have a very strong water peak in your sample, but you, you do, don't want to see the, the water peak. You are interested in the other uh, peaks in your spectra. So we have some pulse sequences that you can uh, remove the, the water peak. 
so for example this one here you can see there's a, a pulse a 90 degree pulse then a block of several different pulses here uh, there are some gradient pulses that are more complex pulse, uh, pulses here and at the end you detect the, the free induction decay and with the Fourier transform you will obtain a nice spectra without the water peak that was uh, um, that was what you wanted, right? And uh, as you can see in this book, uh, there are much more pulse sequences that you can use here, 200 and more NMR experiments, different NMR experiments. And the pulse sequences can be very complex, like you can apply several pulses in the hydrogen channel, some pulses in the nitrogen, pulses for carbon, and transfer the magnetization from one nuclear to another. You can apply gradient pulses and everything together to obtain some different type of information from the chemical structure, right? And all this information you will extract from the spectra. Like you have a reference peak, the, the important information are the position of these peaks, um, the, the, const, the coupling constants, the amplitude of the peaks, the line wide of the peaks, everything provides information from the chemical structure that you have. Of course, we have also bidimensional pulse sequences and you have bidimensional uh, spectra, right? Um, here is just a, a list of some informations you can have from NMR. Uh, everything will be in the spectra and the, for example the, the distances, the hydrogen bonds, the mobility, dynamics, the angles and so on, right? Uh, here some more pictures. Uh, in Brazil we have several um, um, high resolution NMR labs at the universities and at the research institutes, um, mainly with the high field of 400, 500, 600 megahertz. But in the, the biggest one uh, is this one of uh, 900, 90 megahertz, 900 megahertz of 21 Tesla, that is at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, is this one. It's very interesting, it's very good for uh, um, biological studies. Um, well. So, uh, we talked a little bit about the traditional chemistry NMR labor laboratories the, for high resolution NMR, and now we are talking about the, the bench top NMR, the spectrometers that are for. Um, more used in industry and uh, for applications we use in a different way, right? Here um, I have some pictures of some equipments. Uh, these are traditional low field NMR. You insert your sample here and here, you see. This is uh, a different uh, equipment where you put your sample just inside in this position and uh, this is a tube where the, the fluid can uh, flu uh, flows here continuous and be continuously monitored for example if you have um, in, pe in petroleum industry if you have a fluid that have oil water and gas and you, you want to monitor how much of oil water and gas you have in this uh, in this tube so we can monitor it in real time right um, also here i show some medium resolution nuclear magnetic resonance 
we are not talk too much about these equipments, but they are very nice. You also have uh, re some resolution in the spectra, and they are benchtop equipment. So uh, it's growing a lot in these years. So uh, to understand what happens in low resolution, the, the word is say low resolution MR, right? In high field, high resolution, you can see here that these hydrogens from this molecule are represented here. You have resolution to see the, this information, right? In the high field, high laboratories, the, the large scale laboratories. So in the equipment that you do not have uh, um, so, a so good uh, magnetic field, you see that the same sample will produce just uh, a broad line shape. And uh, from uh, here, we also have uh, uh, the same idea. Né? Uh, and the ethanol, you have information about the different chemical environments. But in low field equipments, uh, it's just one broad line. So what you can do with this broad line is uh, another types of uh, studs that are based on the relaxometry, are based on the relaxation times. As you can see, when the magnetization is uh, out of the equilibrium state, uh, the magnetization will return to the position of equilibrium. And this return, as you can see here in, in this picture, occurs with uh, two uh, relaxation times. They are the longitudinal relaxation time, um, and the T1 relaxation time, that uh, is based on this equation. It's an uh, exponential growth, as you can see here. And we also have the transversal relaxation time, T2. That is a decade until zero, um, governed by this equation. Right? These are the, the block equations that describe this, this behavior. Uh, here again, the, the, the animation that show both uh, relaxations occurs at the same time, right? You have the T2 and the T1 uh, uh, simultaneously. So the, the relaxation times, they depend on the environment of the, the nuclear spin. And also, uh, they depend on the mobility of the, the nuclear spin. So as you can see here, for um, here we correlate the relaxation times, T1 and T2, with the, the correlation time of the molecule. Like uh, you can see that T1 and T2 is associated with the mobility of the, the molecules. So, uh, for liquid or small molecule samples, um, T1 and T2 is almost the same, but when you increase the viscosity or the molecular size, you see that T2 is uh, shorter, no? And the T1 is getting um, higher here, right? So uh, depends on the viscosity or depends on the mobility of your chemical uh, sample, the, the, of the sample. You can, by the relaxation times, um, um, determine some macroscopic properties like the viscosity, the, the moisture, the hardness porosity, as I will see, and some other informations. Uh, here again, the, the single pulse, the just one pulse. Uh, in low field, the, as I said, the magnetic field is not so homogeneous. It is uh, a non-homogeneity field. So this will affect more the, the, the signal. So here, we also need to, to show you the T2 star, that is this time, that uh, decay, that uh, the magnetization will disappear here uh, faster than the T2 time, that uh, was what you expected. 
So this um, comes from the inhomogeneity of the, the magnetic field, right? So if we want to obtain the real T2 uh, value, we need to use some special pulse sequences. I will show in some other slide just, just to show you because um, some equipments of low field and MR, uh, the bar of the equipments are bigger. So, for example, when you want to insert a fruit, a whole fruit in, inside the, the, the magnet, the bar is bigger, so the inhomogeneity in your sample will be um, uh, higher, right? So we need to remove this effect of the uh, inhomogeneity field. And here is just a picture show again that we apply some pulses in our sample. Here, for example, in a mango fruit, and we disassemble the spins, the nuclear spins of the sample will respond, and we detect the signal and we do the analysis with the relaxometry methods that I will show. First, uh, the easiest way to analyze a sample in, with a relaxometry is to think about the, 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 the mean value of the, the relaxation times. For example, in this example, you see the, the ripening of a banana in function of relaxation times. As the, the banana changes, the, the biological uh, changes in banana occurs, the time, relaxation times will change here in function of the days. So you can monitor and estimate some parameters from this. But also we have some techniques to obtain more information about the, the samples, like uh, I will explain later, we can determine the distribution of relaxation times. And from this kind of spectra, obtain other information like uh, free water or boundary water, and I will show you some just finish this part. Um, here, the idea, oh, okay, Marcus already talked about uh, the, the main pulse sequence for low field, but just to review, the spin echo pulse sequences that I show here is based on, first, you have a 90 degree pulse, then you wait a, a time tau, then you apply a second pulse of uh, 108 degrees. Then, after another tau time, you will obtain an echo of the, the magnetization. So, the amplitude of this echo is just as the same amplitude of the T2 decay. As you want to determine the, the T2 decay, you can uh, do it with some Creativity, as I will show you with the CPMG pulse sequence. But first, here, uh, this is an animation showing the, the magnet components, the, the isochromatic components of the magnetization and the formation of the echo. Uh, if you want to know, to know more about, uh, for example, simulations of these NMR signals, I have a uh, YouTube video. Um, show you just my phone is okay. Um, I have some uh, YouTube video that is in Portuguese, but uh, there are subtitles in English that if you want to know how to simulate these equations of block equations to produce these uh, low field signals. Also, we have a paper in, it's in Portuguese, but you can see some pictures there. Okay, uh, so the, the idea for the CPMG pulse sequence comes from the, the spin echo pulse sequence that you can observe that changing the tau time, as you can see here, the position of the, the echo is different. And uh, 
um, doing a lot of echoes with different tau times, you can reproduce the T2 decay, the real T2 decay. That is what we are interested in, right? So the, the CPMG is this pulse, uh, block of pulse, it's a pulse sequence, that uh, after each 108 uh, pulse, we produce an echo, another echo, another echo here, and the, the maximum of these echoes uh, produce this decay. That is the real T2 uh, decay, right? Um, also, we have some simulations of the, the CPMG um, um, signals you can see here. All right, so um, when you have, when you obtain this decay experimental, experimental signal, we need to extract the information from this signal um, to do the analysis, right? So we know from block equations that what we have is an exponential decay. So here M0 is just the, the value of the initial amplitude of the signal. Then you see that you have an exponential with minus here, that is a, a decay. The T is the, the time scale here, and T2 is the constant of uh, that describes this the, the, the velocity of this decay, right? So uh, with this equation, we can fit the, the signal uh, using different softwares like MATLAB, Python, Orange Lab, Excel, and determine this, this value to do our analysis. Uh, here, uh, a very simple application, for example, is to try to associate the value of the relaxation times with the content of sugar, for example, in this situation, in a green papaya. Uh, you see from this data that uh, when you increase the here in the Briggs scale, but think in the sugar content of the, the sample and the, the change in the mean value of the, the T2, right? You can determine measuring T2, you can determine the same of the Briggs scale. All right, we will talk more about the, the T2, but just to show you about how we determine the, the T1 relaxation time. The T1, we typically use the inversion recovery pulse sequence that is a 108-degree pulse. Uh, then we wait a tau time, uh, a small time, and uh, we apply the second pulse that is a 90-degree pulse, and we acquire the signal. So doing it for different tau values, as you can see here, doing it very several times, you can determine the amplitude of the signal here. And as you see, the amplitude of this signal will reproduce this uh, exponential growth. That is just the exponential growth of this equation, the uh, longitudinal relaxation time, transversal uh, longitudinal relaxation time. So uh, again, using the some software like Orange or Excel or MATLAB, you can fit this curve with this equation and obtain the T1 value, right? There are other pulse sequences that we use. Um, here I show some pulse sequences that uh, Luis Alberto Colnago uses a lot at Embrapa, as Mark said, he has been developing some uh, new methods in low field NMR. And uh, this pulse sequence, continuous wave free precession, uh, I show here, it's uh, a block of 90 degree pulse with some different phases and time and space. But uh, what we produce with this pulse sequence uh, is that the magnetization 
uh, goes to a state state, as you can see here, and from the signal we can extract three values, that is the, the M0, the, the initial amplitude, uh, a time decay of the signal here, that is we call T star, and there are um, an amplitude in the state state, that is the M SS, and from these three parameters, we can calculate T1 value and T2 value simultaneously. So with just uh, one experiment, you can determine the mean value of T1 and T2 um, uh, very fast. So it's a uh, very fast pulse sequence. For example, in, for industry, if you want to monitor uh, some process with very fast process like flux and so on. Okay, before uh, I talk about other uh, techniques, I also want to show a little bit about the unilateral NMR or mouse NMR. Uh, the idea here is that uh, conventional low field NMR and conventional high field, high resolution NMR, you need to insert your sample inside the magnet, as you see here. But there are uh, situations where you want to analyze um, samples that are bigger than your um, magnet, or you want to analyze some surface uh, or samples that you don't want to destroy. So they developed some uh, equipments, some magnets that the magnetic field goes outside, as you can see here, and the, the coil, the, the detection coil is just here, in, close to the surface, and it's just like a mouse where you can put uh, uh, over the, your sample and detect a signal from some millimeters uh, to determine some properties of that material. For example, it's very interesting for painting or uh, art objects that you don't want to destroy, but you, you want to analyze inside the material. Um, here I show a more modern version that is uh, mouse and MR and position here. Just some more pictures. This is um, a controlled sample and they show here as you can determine the, the lawyer structure uh, from this control sample, like if it's sandy, it's plastic, if it's resin or concrete and so on. So you can obtain information from different lawyers in the sample, right? Um, it can be used for quality control in industry, for example, for tires or uh, food analysis, of course, you can use it, cultural heritage, uh, uh, mainly on samples that you cannot destroy and they are too big for conventional uh, NMR. So for the future, the, we expect to see more and more uh, equipments like this. Uh, nowadays, we have some uh, prototypes of these equipments. Uh, as you can see, the, the companies already uh, commercialized some equipments like this. And they are very small. Uh, it's just like a bag here. Uh, and in some years, we expect to see more and more conventional uh, small uh, mouse NMR to analyze properties. Of course, we still do not have uh, enough resolution for chemical uh, analysis, but uh, uh, thinking about relaxation times analysis, uh, we can determine some properties of the materials. This type of uh, uh, equipment, they are used a lot in the petroleum science, science industry, for example. 
as you can see in this oil well, you can insert your NMR equipment here in the, the well and measure the properties of the rocks. Uh, for example, you can measure how much of oil you have or how much of water or gas or also we can have uh, information about the porosity of the, the rocks and this is, these are very important information uh, about um, how much of oil this well you produce. So there's a lot of money for this uh, and uh, they have this kind of analysis with the spectra of T2 that uh, I said that uh, I will explain in some minutes. To understand the T2 spectra, uh, let's first understand that um, oil and water, they can have different relaxation times, of course, uh, because they are different chemical components. This is easy to understand. But also just water can have different relaxation times. For example, if uh, you think in molecules of water inside uh, a pore, uh, depends on the mobility of the molecule, you two have different correlation times and this will reflect in the relaxation times. So, uh, for example, for small pores, you have very short relaxation times for, uh, with water. If you have a, a bigger part, you have a, a longer relaxation time and bigger one, uh, longer, almost until free water, right? So when you acquire a signal from this rock that is saturated with water or even water and oil and gas, uh, you we will obtain a total signal that comes from all the signals that the, your coin is the sensor is detect right so the the total signal that you detect have all these informations from the small parts to the big ones right from oil from gas from water and uh, to separate this, all these components, we use this mathematical procedure that we call inverse Laplace transform. It's just like the Fourier transform, but it's different mathematical approach. But the idea is just we convert the, the free induction decay. Here is not the free induction decay. Here is the T2 decay from the, the CPMG. And we convert it in a spectrum, as you can see here, where the small, the shorter components of relaxation times, uh, for example, oil will uh, be transformed in this peak, and the longer relaxation times from water, uh, for example, here is this another peak. So here you can quantify properly how much of water we have, how much of oil we have, and this is used a lot in petroleum industry, but also in food analysis, of course. So, for example, if you have some oil seeds and you want to determine how much of water and how much of oil I have without destroying the, the sample, we can use NMR, right? Um, and this is the main idea, is based on CPMG pulse sequence and the processing with inverse Laplace transform. Uh, of course, there are sample, samples that are very complex samples. You have a lot of signals there, so the spectra will be very broad, as you can see here. And here you have information about water, oil, gas, and so on, different porosities, different size of pores, and so there are different kinds, types of softwares that you can use for this analysis. These are the, the main important softwares. Most 
of the spectrometers uh, cams with his own um, software to do this but uh, this is um, some area that I work uh, developing some uh, codes for this type of mathematical analysis of the signal so we have a paper it's again in Portuguese but uh, um, uh, they, they, uh, I have there some codes for do, to do this um, uh, inverse Laplace uh, transform. Also, I have a new YouTube talk where I explain how, how it works and uh, it has subtitle in English again. All right, so I will not talk about the, the mathematical of this analysis, but the, the main idea here is that uh, uh, you essentially, uh, the code assumes that you do not have just one exponential time in your signal, but the code assumes that you have a distribution of exponential times. So uh, the code will calculate the amplitudes in this spectra in function of different relaxation times. And of course, uh, the analysis uh, can be applied for CPMG, T2 relaxation times, but also we can apply this approach for different pulse sequences, like if you have uh, inversion recovery, uh, with T1 information, you just need to change the, the kernel, the, the main function of the, the, the code, and then you will produce a spectra of T1 relaxation times. Or other pulse sequences also, you can apply it. Um, just to finish the idea about the, the petroleum size, uh, they can insert these unilateral magnets to analyze the rocks in, uh, of the oil well, but also they can um, bring some uh, samples for the lab and analyze it in the lab. So with the, the uh, tissue spectra, they can analyze the, the porosity of the samples, like uh, if they have big pores or very small pores, if the pores, they have connectivity between them, is a very important information also, and other uh, information. Here again, just show the main technique, CPMG, uh, multi-exponential decay, and the two spectra. Okay, so let's think uh, in food analysis, right? Uh, some techniques are only based on the, the mean value of the uh, relaxation time, as you can see here, but also analyze the T2 distribution, we can uh, obtain and quantify information from free water or bonded water or uh, protein or whatever you want to, but you need to calibrate the samples, of course. It's not a direct uh, information as we have in high resolution, NMR in some case. So, for example, we can associate the, the distribution of the relaxation times with some properties of the, the samples, like the texture, the, the hardness of the sample, we can associate the, the relaxation times with the amount of sugar, uh, of protein, of oil, and so on, All right? So, but we need to calibrate the systems and uh, we need to, to produce the, the model for that kind of sample. Uh, a little bit more about techniques, uh, it's important to know also that uh, there are situations where um, the spectra that I showed you with the relaxation times, uh, all the signals are overlapped, like water and oil, they are all overlapped and you do not know 
how much of water, how much of oil you have. So for these situations, it can be interesting to, to do some bidimensional experiments. Here you can see, for example, water and oil, when they perform a bidimensional experiment, you can properly separate what is peaks from water and what is peaks from oil, right? So to produce these maps, uh, bidimensional maps, uh, the pulse sequences are based on this type of pulse sequences, where first we have a block of uh, pulse that we call prepara the preparation block of pulse. Then here we have an evolution time. It's a time you need to wait, and we change the value of this time. Uh, uh, then we have the, the mixing block of pulse, and after that the, the detection of the signal. So we change this this time. We do it several times and do the detection of the signal several times, and placing uh, each line uh, here, as you can see in this picture, uh, one another the next. You produce this uh, two-dimensional uh, data signal in the time domain, right? Here in the time domain. Then um, we need a bidimensional inverse Laplace transform to transform this uh, time domain signal to a, a type of spectra, as you can see here, in function of the T2 relaxation times and here in this other dimension, and the T1 relaxation times. So we have a map that correlates the, the, the time uh, relaxation times, right? Of course, these experiments, uh, you need to do N, uh, several experiments to detect all the, the lines in this picture, and so it's very time uh, consuming, right? But it can be very useful in some applications. Here, I, I just show you the, the, the pulse sequence to produce the T1, T2 map, it's a type of uh, inversion recovery pulse sequence here and a CPMG pulse sequence here. You obtain that uh, B dimensional uh, uh, um, uh, signal in the time domain. Then you do the inverse Laplace transform in 2D and you obtain this map. In this dimension, you see the T2 distribution, in this dimension, the T1. And here you can separate the, the peaks, for example, for other oil and the other more complex system. Um, also, we have different pool sequences for two-dimensional uh, analysis. Like in this situation, we can analyze a diffusion of the, the molecules in function of the uh, relaxation times. For example, in this application here, in this picture, you see that in one dimensional uh, relaxation times, the water, the water, the oil, and the gas, they are almost all together here, but they have different uh, diffusion coefficients, right? Of the gas, the water here, and the oil here. So, uh, when you use some ga gradient pulses, you can um, separate the components based on the diffusion coefficients. And so you produce this type of maps, right? The relaxation times in function of the coefficient distribution, uh, diffusion coefficient. This is an interesting map that shows uh, maps for aspargus. Uh, of course, you can imagine that the diffusion of the molecules in this direction of the, the aspargus, it's uh, much more easier than uh, in a perpendicular way. 
So they did uh, an experiment show it in, in this type of map. You see here in, in black uh, is the, um, the, the, the map for a parallel aspargus in a parallel with the, the magnetic field and here in red the when it is perpendicular. So what I want to show you here is that uh, with this type of maps, you can determine uh, information about the, the structure inside your sample, right? Uh, for example, in Asparagus, very interesting one, right? Um, also, uh, we have T2, T2 maps. In both dimensionals here, we have the T2 relaxation times, and this uh, applications are interesting when you want to see if, it, for example, the pores have connection between them. If they have connection, the, the fluid can come from here to here. And this will result in some uh, peaks of the diagonal in these maps. So for example, here, uh, a system that there is no connection of the pores, and here it's bigger connections between the pores. So you can determine these connections of the pores. This is very interesting because, in, for example, for uh, petroleum in the rocks, uh, you can have big pores, but if the pores do not have connections between them, the, the fluid will not uh, go out of the pores, right? So it's important to have this, these connections and to measure it, right? Um, this is a very nice paper about um, the use of these maps, these two-dimensional maps in food products, right? They, they show a lot of examples for cheese, for milk, uh, cream cheese, and other foodstuffs, and it's a uh, very, very uh, complex paper. Uh, it's, it's important to understand that this diffusion and these relaxation times, they are sensitive to the, to the molecular size, the interaction between the molecules. So uh, as your sample is very heterogeneous, you can obtain information about the micro level the microscopic level of the samples, right? Others applications outside the food analysis are in rocks, soils, bones, woods, uh, cements, ceramics. Um, this is very interesting one for diagnosed um, osteoporosis disease that uh, you have uh, different pore um, uh, porosity in the bonds, so we can obtain information with these methods. Uh, this other one outside the food is a very nice tool. Uh, the relaxometry is used for diagnosis of malaria, so they can analyze the blood, but uh, as you see, they have uh, a very special uh, protocol to prepare the sample. Then, uh, after this protocol to, to prepare the sample, you can detect uh, infected uh, cells and unaffected cells, basically based on the relaxation times from a CPMG two seconds, right? So it's a very nice application of the, the relaxometry methods. All right, so uh, talking about food analysis a little bit. Uh, there are several spectroscopy that uh, industry uses for food analysis, but some spectroscopy, they can only analyze the, the surface of the samples. For example, here in this apple, uh, with some laser technique, uh, spectroscopy, you are only analyzed the, the surface, and the surface is 
do not provide information for you from inside the sample. And uh, the interesting point about NMR is that the signal they comes from all the sample that is in the here inside the probe. So we can obtain information in, from the inside of your fruit or your sample, right? This is the main advantages, I, I would say. Of course, you can do the imaging NMR to analyze the, your samples. You can do the, the imagings of the internal parts. But the, to produce an imaging is very time consuming. So, uh, for industry, you do not want to, to spend a lot of time doing the image to analyze. And the, the relaxometry methods, the signal that we detect, uh, they have an average information about the, your system, right? So, we are not talking about imaging, but uh, just to show you, this is very nice. Uh, to show here in Brazil, uh, you know that agriculture is a very important uh, economic activity for Brazil. And uh, since the beginning of NMR, the, the scientists, they used the, the nuclear magnet resonance for food analysis. And uh, for example, when they built a, a homemade spectrometer here in Brazil, the first homemade spectrometer, the first imaging that they did was from the, this fruit, uh, it's okra fruit, and because it was interesting to see the, the internal parts of the okra, so uh, it was in 1984, it, it's a very nice picture for, for the time. Um, today, uh, we have several research institutes and universities that develop NMR methods for applications in agriculture. Um, here in Brazil, um, a very famous one is Luiz Alberto Colnago, that Marcos uh, said to you. That, uh, he, he works at the Embrapa, that is uh, the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation. And, uh, well, he produced a lot of work on how to de develop and adapt the methods for the industry uh, applications of these uh, electrometry methods and also high resolution, high resolution uh, methods. Uh, and he will give a talk, I believe, for you uh, in this course, so it will be very interesting. Uh, much of the work I will show you here, uh, my work is together with Conago, so uh, maybe something will be uh, show you again. But um, back to the methods, um, one of the main methods in food analysis is the spin echo, because with the spin echo that you produce an echo, uh, a very easy way to, to estimate some information of your food is to associate that information with the amplitude of the echo. You, you can do it when you can, for example, remove the water component, choosing the appropriate time here, and only see the information from oil, for example. Then you can produce uh, a calibration where measuring the echo amplitude, you can determine the, the content of oil, for example, in snacks. So you can use it in industry to control the, the quality of your products or control a process. Um, here, uh, oil content in snack foods, uh, here you can calibrate it in function of the echo amplitude, for example, or in function of the relaxation times, uh, and here you can obtain the oil content. It's just calibration, and you can do different calibrations for different food um, stuff. So, well, 
Uh, here again, Conago at Embrapa showing some uh, different samples here. The, in Brazil, the oil seeds uh, are very important, so you can uh, estimate and calculate how much of oil, um, uh, fat, protein content, um, fat acid content, and the, the industry uses these equipments and Embrapa develops a lot of methods to do it for different materials, chocolate, oils, margarines, and so on. Uh, they also had developed some methods for fast analysis in a production line, as you can see here. Uh, these uh, fast sensors, they allow um, the analysis of thousands of samples uh, per hour, and they are no destructively, so they uh, don't cause damage to the samples. It is interesting, right? Um, okay, so uh, for it works, they had to develop, dev develop that methods I talked to you about the, the, the CWFP, very fast pulse sequences, and so on. This is a video, but uh, it's not working here, but the video, the idea was to show you it working, but the idea you can measure it in line, right? And you can apply these methods for oil seeds and uh, in function of the CWFP echo amplitudes and so on. This is from sunflower, pea seeds, oil, um, and also today they are developing methods for other um, foods that are important in the economic level for Brazil, like macaúba, the, the palm oil, uh, soy, um, very other materials. Just to, to put everything together, uh, I need to talk that uh, we also use chemometrics uh, with to analyze NMR data. So there are a lot of mathematical methods that uh, we call the, the chemometric methods that try to when you insert a lot of signals from different materials or different samples, and you want that the, the compute, the intelligence of the computer separate the groups, like determine uh, which type of seed you have, or how much oil do you have, or if the sample was adulterate, or, or so on, you can try to do this analysis with these methods, principal component analysis, SINCA, and so on. This will separate the, the samples with their properties. And this is have been used a lot in food analysis. You measure the signal with NMR uh, from different samples, a lot of samples, then you apply the chemiometric methods and separate the groups. And this is a very fast and easy approach for industry also. And Conago have a lot of work showing this working for uh, plumes and for uh, deuterations and uh, detection and quantification of milk deuteration using time domain NMR and the chemiometric methods to you can separate the groups in function of how much the milk was adulterate or or if the milk have uh, is not good. Um, you can use this uh, methodology and then low field NMR and chemo chemometrics to discover if the sample was um, adulterate, right? So for coffee, um, they, they are trying to apply these methods. And of course, the, the money involved in this uh, type of uh, adulterations is very high. So also they try to develop methods to analyze um, foods inside the, the bottle, for example, for um, wine and other uh, materials or other food, 
stuff with this type of magnets that you can insert the, the food that will be analyzed here. Uh, th th this is possible, you need to understand that this is possible because, um, for example, th this application, this is from France, they showed that uh, uh, wines that are produced in different regions, th the soil is different, so the the, the metals that you will find uh, in the wine that you produce are di in different concentrations and these metals will affect the relaxation times of the, the wine and using the, this intelligence of the, the chemiometric methods you can determine, for example, if someone uh, have um, adulterate some wine, saying that they produce it there, but it's not from that, that region. So, also there are a lot of applications uh, in this way. Right, so now I'm almost finishing, but just to show you some different applications that also we can apply in food analysis. Uh, at the, Petrobras that I said I, I worked during my postdoctor, we was trying to develop some methods for more rigid materials, for materials that they are not so liquid, right? As petroleum, asphalt, cement, um, vax, paraffins, uh, polymers, and, and try to see, uh, obtain information from these materials with low field NMR. In these situations, um, the signal decays very fast, so there's no enough time for the sensor to properly detect the signal. This we call the, the dead time of the spectrometer. So we need to modify the, the pulse sequences to try to obtain all the signal uh, from the sample, right? From the rigid parts and from the, the parts that we have more mobility. This is just, this is important, we're sorry about it, but the idea is just show that the, the, the pool sequence, we need to change it to, to obtain the, the real information that we want. The idea is that the, uh, the rigid parts, the, the information from the rigid parts uh, was losing, so how to, um, to obtain this information that was here in the dead time. And well, we have some models for it, but the important thing is at the end, we obtain all the information from mobile, amorphous region, and the rigid parts. And we can quantify how much of each we have. So for example, in a polymer, you can quantify the crystallinity regions of that polymer the amorphous reg uh, region for cement asphalt uh, that is one product that uh, Petrobras produce, uh, there is the uh, special conditional conditions where this asphalt is of high quality. So the price of this product is better and we can develop NMR methods to determine if this is a very good uh, cap or it's a bad cap that it will not produce a good road, right? Um, the degradations of polymers uh, is also can be monitored by low field NMR, basically uh, monitoring the, the rigid and the amorphous uh, uh, area in the T3 spectrum. Um, we have also tried to these methodologies for um, to see the dynamic process in photopolymerization uh, of dental resins and um, some other materials that we have to try to apply in these methodologies. But uh, just showing some um, works that I had participate here. Um, it's not with relaxometry, but is the, the soil being in water deficient conditions 
and they were studying the metabolomics of this uh, uh, this stuff when they are in water deficient conditions. This, this is not related to, to the reluctant methods, but uh, we also have some other studies in high resolution MR to determine physical chemical properties oil of some fat acids that are important for biodiesel. Um, of course, it's all, all related with agriculture, if you see. Um, adulterations of biodiesel um, full quality control, you can use these spectra and the, the relaxation types. Uh, Internal quality control of palmer mangoes. Of course, uh, as I said, you could produce an imaging of the mango, but it's much faster to, to produce just a relaxometry spectra. And with the, chemi the chemiometric methods, just separate what is a high quality mango and what is a bad mango that has low price. Um, we also have been applying these methods for uh, studied meat. Uh, the, here is the breast muscle uh, of broad, uh, broad chickens. So um, we have some different myopathies, uh, myopathies that we have for, for chicken. And this reflects on the water mobility in these structures and the water mobility will be reflected in the T2 uh, distribution times and analyzing several samples, we can use the chemiometrics and also determine some quality parameters for these uh, foods. Ch uh, meat are also uh, something that is very important in Brazil. Uh, so we have other uh, works with uh, uh, meat. This is for beef. And uh, well, here uh, was the, the wrong picture, but uh, we, uh, we was studying the, uh, evaluated the aging of the, the meat, right? Then can use some adulterations, the chemical adulterations to, 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 to change the, the quality of the, the meat, right? And you can detect it with an MR. Um, also here for beef uh, with chemiometrics and different applications, different calibrations of the, the methods. I'm almost finishing, just a little review of the idea. The NMR have um, high resolution NMR that you can use in determinations of molecular structures you can use imaging and MR, you can, so the applications are in material science, chemical engineer, in food analysis, in geophysics, in petroleum science, and it's very useful. There are a lot of different equipments that the, the scientists and researchers and industry are using for it. Just to have an idea of the, the cost, the, the price uh, of a spectrometer of a high resolution and MR for imaging and MR, um, low field and MR will be like this. Um, but the, the advantage is, is that you do not need the, the, the cryogenic uh, liquids like the allium, the, like, uh, allium and nitrogen uh, liquid. For, to keep the, the temperature, as I said about the, the superconductor uh, solenoid, and how you pay for a measurement in industry, right? This is just a comparison of the elements you have here, sensibility, resolution, structural determinations, it's more expensive. Uh, here you have the relaxometry methods, um, it's low cost, and so it's a bench topic. I mean. To finish, uh, I would recommend you, if you like the NMR area, the, there's some class from Paul Callaghan in, at YouTube. This, this is the link. He explained the basis of the NMR uh, technique. It's also very nice. There are some, some books here. At my YouTube channel, 
I have only two videos that uh, there are subtitles in English, but uh, maybe it's about the inverse Laplace transform and about signal simulations in NMR. Uh, can be interesting. And so uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Marcus, who invited me for this talk. Um, well, I don't know if I was I talking too fast. Uh, sorry for my English is not so good to understand, but uh, well, hope you like it. Thiago, thank you very much. It's, it's very, very good talking and a uh, lot of explanations, uh, applications, uh, definitions of concepts and showing us how um, the enema parameters are obtained and also how these different parameters can be used to probe and to analyze food. So, and <laughs> I'm very glad to have you explaining all of this. Uh, I, I open for questions or for comments the, the other participants if they want to, to ask. Uh, Antonio can be the first. <laughs> and, well, I, I, oh my God, very difficult question. <laughs> it's really interesting. So feel free to, to ask. Uh, Jiba can be the first. Okay, okay. First of all, Tiago, thank you very much for your lecture. You really cover all the aspects, or most of the important aspects of the NMA. So I think he, everybody can have some idea about this. Okay. Indeed, I, I don't have a question, but uh, it's a curiosity. Uh, in your slide, number, number 51. Let's see. 51. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, um, normally, uh, you show this, uh, you use uh, NMA or a small NMA or uh, a mouse NMA uh, to, as a probe to go to the, 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 the oil. Okay? Yes. yes. But normally, we uh, can use it. This is the question. We can use it not only on vertical like you you show on this on this picture but normally when you try to find the petrol you need to maybe some deviation so my question is is possible to use the nma like a probe to you know to uh, as a guide to find but not uh, direct, not straight ahead, not on the ver vertical one, but you know, try to find one, try to find the way uh, where yeah. is the petrol. I get, I get it. Yeah, okay. Th that's an interesting question, Jiba. Uh, I'm not sure. I know that they have sensors that uh, uh, they put uh, and they monitor the the rocks while they are uh, preferring the, the, the well. But I didn't thought about it. Maybe they can use this information to guide the, 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 the way. But I really don't, I'm not sure. But it's really interesting to, to think about it, yeah. Maybe they use it, yeah, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jiba, thank you very much. So I have a question, but I invite the, the guests, the participants to address questions, so feel free. So, yeah, you, and also comments. Hey, so, I have a, a question. Oh, great. You're going to make a team to make or nothing? We're going to only sell Palestra. Uh, sorry, the, the lines. What? We're gonna make activity, or uh, we only, only see 
No, I, start... I, I don't know, Marcos. I, I, yes, I have a question. I have already a question, a short uh, amount of questions. After this, I will ask Tiago to make two or three questions. We can talk later on and to type some few more questions. Indeed, in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to show you the questionnaire and how you can access these questions from the, the platform we are using. So we can show you in, in the few minutes. OK? OK, thanks. So we, we, we will have some, some few questions about this. And also, for the next week, probably we'll have some more four, five questions. So from now on, it's it for each week, we we go, we will have some more four, five, or maximum six questions per week. So we can check out how we are going in developing the concepts. So yeah. So I have a question, Thiago, and okay. in these three minutes, I'm going to ask you so the guys can formulate their own questions. <laughs> Let's see. So you presented uh, a slide showing us how you or how one can correlate the relaxation times with the bricks content, that means the sweetness of uh, a fruit. So could you go there? I don't remember, is the, the, the number? It's a publication on 2013, um, I guess, communications. Uh, it was about the papaya or? Yes, papaya, exactly. Let's see if but, I can find yeah. it. It was just the first oh, example here, yeah. Oh, yes, it's, it's nice. So you correlated, and my, it's a curiosity and also a question. And how could you correlate, it's a, a, a causal or, or it's just a method of correlation. What's the source of the signal and how the bricks content can uh, influence the relaxation times. So, yeah, Marcus, uh, I believe here the idea is that uh, depends on the, the environment of the, the water molecules, the, the relaxation times will change. So, for example, we know that when we have some paramagnetical metals in, in, in the water, you can change the, the effective magnet that the water molecules are feeling. So this, uh, this inhomogeneity that you introduce uh, in the, like around the, the molecules, you change the average T2 value. So I believe here the idea is that when you have sugar in the system, for example, and this will be in interacting with the water system, and uh, this will change the, the T2. Probably course, speeding up the relaxation. Yeah, the yeah. Water. And of course, this is not always uh, um, a, a very nice uh, line like this, like you can easily find how much of sugar you have it, uh, from the T2. But there are a lot of systems that this works very well, and the industry just wants to use it and, <laughs> and go on. And sometimes, of course, yeah. there are other times you, you want to um, chemical information, right? OK, thank you. I have some more questions, but I'm, I'm quite um, <laughs> okay. uh, eager to, to listen to to all the questions. Let me see if someone has typed on. Yeah, all of the participants are, thank you. I'm also <laughs> very thankful for this. Oh, yeah. uh, if, if someone can think about a question, 
I would like to show you how can you access the platform and then to interact because from now on, uh, you, you can still share your slides, Thiago, uh, just in yes. two share three it. minutes to show, you, you can keep it. Oh, okay, you have a It's just page. some link is for the, the, the YouTube that I have two, two videos that have wow. subtitles in English, but I can also share the slides if... Uh, oh, yes, it, it would be great. I can show you uh, how we are sharing the, the stuff. Okay. It's very interesting, the, the slides. So let me show you... Um, this is, is the platform you might be you might access this platform okay so i i choose the the wrong one so just a minute <laughs> okay this one so let me Can I remove the ufop aberta yeah so this is the platform we are using. So if we just click on here, if we just pass uh, the tip of the mouse on, we can see two, uh, we, we can choose the English, we can choose uh, American English, if I'm not wrong, or Brazil English, okay? So if I recommend you to choose English because the, the information will be on English. So we can log in, my course, so we have Brazilian food stuff. So this is the first questionnaire. And here's the, the class given by Tiago. We are going to put the link to the recording. And also, uh, the, if Tiago is it's, it's happy with this, we can share his web page and the YouTube videos. Indeed, Tiago, I used one of these animations because I didn't know the author. Okay. This is circulating freely on the web. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know I use it, but uh, it's, That's great, yeah. uh, maybe a lot of other people might have used it. <laughs> so yeah. it's good for you. That's yeah. the idea, that's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to know that you uh, made it. And yeah. also, yeah. So the, the first question, uh, the first quiz. So you can just click on. Okay, I didn't. Okay, click on this. So we have some. This is our first question about the basic concepts of an uh, It's quite good because Tiago reviewed a lot of concepts and explained it in a pedagogy a didactic and pedagogical way. And so we have some questions. So some of them, you have to choose one, right questions, or two or more, one or more questions might be right. So you can just, uh, okay, return. So you can go the next page and previous ones. So some questions, you must provide a short answer. For example, here, we must provide the frequency in Hertz without the units or dimensions. So we have other questions for pure numbers. We have some, uh, just one question is right or some just one question is incorrect. So that, that's the, the point here. So we can just check how we are doing this, this course. For the next week, we are going to release another set of questions or some ways to interact with you. So guys, I don't have uh, information today. I also have some uh, to create a new account or there is a password. Julia, uh, there is a, a Vitaly is asking us if we if uh, if they should create a new password. Uh, yes. Uh, 
Vitaly, I sent you a quick tutorial, but I can resend uh, the tutorial to assess the platform. But And after that, if you have any questions, you can just text me and then I, I can help you. But I will resend the email. Okay, I will be available as well. So this week, uh, a lot of my classes were cancelled. Not cancelled, but postponed because I, I cannot work at the university because of the <laughs> infection. So I have more spare time, more time to devote to the course. So, uh, Vitaly, you, you just write us via email. So Julia is going to help you, and I, I, I will be available as well. Thiago, again, thank you very much. So I have all the questions. So these are the questions. I would like to write it for you. So you can base on these questions and to write down some two or three or more questions if you, if you want. Yeah. Well, the guys might... <laughs> So I can share your email as well with them. Yeah. So if they have a question, so I can, I can contact you directly. Okay. So if some of these I worked as well with uh, 1D, 2D relaxometries, but I'm very happy how uh, you presented this stuff. And yeah, that's all. Guys, if you want to contact us, I will send you emails in between the classes. I think this is a better way to keep all of us on resonance. <laughs> I mean, we can just um, follow in a closer way. Uh, Thiago, I received some emails because they will access your class because for some reasons they cannot could not be uh, present during the class. Okay. Yeah. So, Marcos, yeah, and of course, and thank you very much for inviting me for this talk. I, I, I'm very happy. And well, if you need something more, uh, you have my mail here or? Yes, I can share your mail. Your mail we are texting, but if you want to write it on the. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, yes. So, yeah, I will use this, um, this stuff as well to, uh, to share these informations on and just clicking on in order to be available later on. So I'm going to share this information. What is the website of... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, the website is Ufopia Berta, but... I have to ask if they can include you because they are for the participants, but I, I think no, you no, should no, no. be accessed. Okay, I will show you. And this is the Fopia Beta. Is is a platform Julia may know better than I do because uh, this is a platform uh, the, the university is using in order to is, is an interface between the the organization and the students okay but this is the the far <laughs> I, I, I I don't know better than this sorry okay. it's, a, it's a shame yeah no problem but uh, that's great. I, I will see how to to share this with with you. So yeah. Yeah. also the video would be nice to have. Oh yes, I will, I, yeah. I'm going to share these videos with uh, all of you. Uh, I would like to to thank you, Antonio, Giba as well, and all of you because so if someone cannot access the video, please write us write for me or write Julie, we will provide you how to access or the, the direct uh, link, so Tiago as well. So that's it. Okay. So wow, two, two hours, it, it's passed quite uh, fast. Thank you very much again, Tiago. Thank you very much, 
everyone. Next week, we are going to have two interesting um, lectures or speeches uh, provided by Giba, Antonio Ferreira, Professor Antonio Ferreira, and by Dr. Conago. They are going to present a lot of applications and a lot of, uh, of information how to obtain and how to know better fruits and food stuff. So great. Okay, bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Okay, bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay, see ya. See you. Marilandi, I'm gonna contact uh, Thiago for you. Thank you. Okay. Let's stop recording.